In a federal society like Australia, power is divided between federal, state and local governments. But how do we decide who should do what? The way power is allocated has significant implications for citizens' rights, their access to justice, and even the way they live their daily lives in the community. And while there are constitutional and historical factors that influence this division of power, there's always room for improvement and reform, so it's important that we get this balance right. Hi there, I'm Dr Jacob Dean, and in this video we'll be talking about the principle of subsidiarity. You may be familiar with subsidiarity as calling for decisions of government to be made as close to the people as possible. In this video, I'll explain how subsidiarity plays a crucial role in the allocation of power within society. I'll consider three key issues. Why does subsidiarity matter? What challenges does it face? And how can research ensure that subsidiarity remains a meaningful principle within legal and policy spheres? Subsidiarity is sometimes seen as a useful principle for guiding the allocation of power within society because it brings government closer to the people. In doing so, it promotes democratic participation, ensures that governments are held accountable, and it makes sure that policy and service delivery is responsive to the needs of citizens. When we think about community justice in a broad sense, subsidiarity calls for a system that is able to account for and recognise individual and community differences. It understands that communities are best placed to identify and serve their own needs. In practice, We've seen subsidiarity provide useful guidance on federal reform in places like Australia and Switzerland. But for all these benefits, some scholars and practitioners are concerned that subsidiarity is unimportant or meaningless. In Australia, for example, Michelle Evans argued that Australia can no longer be seen as an authentic federation because the principle of subsidiarity has been disregarded by the High Court in decisions like the Work Choices case in 2006. Looking further afield, in the UK, former Prime Minister David Cameron said that nobody knows what subsidiarity means and he promised not to use it again. The problem with these approaches is that when policymakers, politicians and legal practitioners shy away from subsidiarity, the risk is that citizens will miss out on the benefits the principle can provide. So how can we ensure that subsidiarity remains viable for promoting innovative approaches to community justice and good policy? My research focuses on subsidiarity's meaning, both in a definitional sense and in terms of its importance. To begin, what does subsidiarity mean? Earlier, I said that we can understand subsidiarity as calling for decisions of government to be made as close to the people as possible. That's the common approach, especially here in Australia but it doesn't capture the principle's full meaning and in fact is quite a narrow decentralist one. Subsidiarity has a long history stretching all the way back to Aristotle's writings in ancient Greece and its use within the ancient Roman legions. When we consider this full history we see a number of other important elements. To combine these approaches I argue that we're best off understanding subsidiarity in a holistic way as being made up of three elements. Decentralism, non-absorption and support. Taking this broader view can also help us understand whether the principle is important. In Australia, we tend to think of the principle as being meaningless because of the strong trend of centralism in our federation. But if we think of the decentralist element as being only one third of the principle's meaning, is it possible that we can reach new and important insights into the principle's meaning by taking a broader perspective. To answer this question, I've taken the novel approach of studying public attitudes towards subsidiarity, which is a world first. As part of the International Constitutional Values Survey, I developed a three-item measure of attitudes towards subsidiarity. In this video, I'll just focus on the Australian results. I found significant differences in people's attitudes towards the three elements, and when we ran the surveys again in 2018, we found similar results, showing that the measure is reliable. We can therefore conclude that the average Australian is ambivalent towards decentralism, but is much more attached to the elements of non-absorption and especially supportive ideas of subsidiarity. This has some really important implications. Most obviously, it confirms that we need to take a broad approach to understanding subsidiarity's meaning. 
But to revisit the question of how we divide power within our federal society, these results suggest that citizens are less concerned with the vertical distribution of power and are instead more concerned with the support systems that go with it. Citizens see great value in empowering local communities. In practical terms, this could mean reforming the GST system or increasing the number of untied grants under Section 96 of our Constitution to ensure that lower levels of government are empowered to fulfil their policy responsibilities. When we think about community justice, it also suggests that citizens see great value in community initiatives and innovations that will lead to a fairer and equitable society. In summary, we've seen that subsidiarity offers a useful guide to the allocation of power within society. Some scholars question the principle's importance based on trends of centralism within Australia. However, I've demonstrated that by taking a new, broader approach and by studying public attitudes, we can gain a fresh perspective to the principle's importance. In particular, supportive elements of the principle are likely to be especially important within Australia. So how can subsidiarity help inform your research or improve your community? I look forward to finding out. Thanks for watching.